And we're off. Another episode of Gregorian Rant. And today we have a guest with us, a family physician, PhD in psychology, undergrad in biology from MIT at the age of 19, an MD and PhD from UPenn, an author and New York Times bestseller, Dr. Leonard Sachs. And I personally could not be more excited. Um, for this, I had to arm wrestle Father Brian for the opportunity to sit down with you. And as a quick backstory for you, Dr. Sachs, Father Brian and I typically do this podcast together. And it was started from the standpoint of um, I'm newer to Catholicism and my faith. I lived a very secular life. Um, came from a very divorced family from a young age and aspired to be a professional athlete. And had a brief cup of coffee with the Seattle Seahawks, but along that journey, everything around for me was um, about me reaching the top pinnacle. And as soon as football was taken away from me, I lost my identity. And then my identity, identity became my mom. My mom passed away unexpectedly in 2015, lost my identity again, and uh, since then have been on its journey. And the whole purpose of this podcast started of as I start to live my life as a Christian, trying to then explain why I'm doing it and doing it the way that the church is teaching is really hard for a lot of my friends in LA. It's really hard for them to understand why I'm going to marry somebody that I'm not living with and why I'm no longer trying to achieve Forbes 30 under 30 list and instead trying to live a virtuous life. And so I was recently married and, um, I was married last year during the coronavirus and I've just had my first child, little, little Gianna. And my mother-in-law introduced me to your book. And I instantly became absolutely obsessed with your book because it flipped my world upside down and everything that one I aspire to, but what I'm used to, I lived everything that you kind of discussed. So I could not be more excited for this opportunity and cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come out from uh, Pennsylvania. Well, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, no, I, uh, it's, it's a big thing for me. And I, I think anyone here at Lords, we have this opportunity. I've had the opportunity all day to kind of sit in a seminar that you gave. And tonight we're going to discuss a book you wrote, um, really focused on the collapse of parenting. And as I've gotten to study you a lot in the, especially the last couple of weeks trying to prepare for this. I think I've looked at, and my biggest question, and I'm starting to realize it with my new little girl, is I am so scared to be a parent. And I'm scared because I see, it feels like my back is always against the wall with where culture is today. And I think my goal in this podcast is to get us to a point, and I know you've discussed it in your book, but what is the purpose of life? And so in order to get there, I'd love to take a step back and starting in chapter one of The Collapse of Parenting. Um, where our culture is today and how we've become set and we found ourselves in such a disrespectful place um, and kind of just diving in from there and seeing where the journey takes us. Okay. Uh, so when I talk about a culture, I always like to be grounded in evidence. Um, there's a great danger. Uh, you don't want to be ranting about, well, kids these days, they don't know what's good. Uh, you know, I, when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, I remember hearing parents say, oh, the Beatles are terrible. You know, why can't kids like Frank Sinatra? So every generation has its own preferences in music and in culture. And uh, we want to be careful not to succumb to that temptation of assuming that what well, the music I grew up is better than the kids uh, music kids are listening to today. So I think it's very useful to uh, look to objective, peer-reviewed research. And one study I'm often citing is from UCLA. So the researchers at UCA, UCLA looked at the most popular TV shows in the United States that were targeting children and teenagers. And they looked at 1967, 77, 87, 97, 2007, and 2017. And they ranked the shows on 16 different parameters with a focus on what's the show really teaching about what's important and what's valuable and, and what should we strive for? And they found great consistency from 1967 through 1997 
in terms of what the shows were teaching, whether it was uh, the Andrew Griffith Show in 1967, uh, Happy Days in 1977, Family Ties in 1987, or Buffy the Vampire Slayer in 1997, even though those shows are very different shows, uh, very different genres, very different production values, it was still the case that every one of those shows and, and the, the top shows along with them was communicating the message that what really matters is doing the right thing. Uh, even if it hurts, telling the truth, even if it hurts, being a good friend, even if it's not easy. And that was consistent straight through. But then between two th 1997 and 2007, they found that American culture flipped upside down. And the most popular TV shows of, two of 2007, shows like Survivor, iCarly, and American Idol, all of a sudden are about winning and being famous. Winning and being famous would have been number 14 or number 16 for the previous decades, and suddenly they're number one. Winning and being famous become number one. Being wealthy suddenly is very important, and this was not at all true previously. And this, and this remains true in 2017. What happened? What happened between 1997 and 2007 that turned American culture upside down? And what the scholars think happened is social media. Social media, beginning with Facebook, but then Instagram, and now TikTok, transformed American culture so that being popular, being liked, suddenly became the most important thing uh, in the cultures experienced by young Americans. And doing the right thing, you know, that's going to get you voted off the island. Uh, so an important transformation in American culture, parents need to be aware of how this change in culture has put their kids at risk. Because the American, American popular culture of 1997 and, and all the decades earlier, as far as we can tell, put a goal out there that is within reach for every kid. Any person can, can be a better person, can do the right thing. Um, and these shows consistently play down the importance of being famous or being wealthy. I remember, and my daughter and I have watched every episode of The Andy Griffith Show. Um, and I remember there's an episode where Aunt B has the opportunity to become rich and famous. Um, she is in the hardware store talking to a strange man about this uh, great cleaning product. And it just so happens the man she's talking to is the owner of the national company that makes those products. And he says, Aunt B, you were so persuasive. I want to make a commercial with you talking about my product and how great it is. And so she makes a TV commercial and sales explode. And he says, Aunt B, I'm going to make you rich and famous. You're going to be our national spokesman. We're going to fly you around the country. You're going to go to stores and talk to women about these cleaning products. You're going to be on commercials across the country. We're going to make you rich and famous. And she's tempted and she thinks about it. And this is what the episode is about. But at the end of the episode, she says, no, why would I want to be rich and famous? I don't need that. I don't want that. My place is here at home with Andy and Opie. And that's very characteristic of American culture, 1967 through 1997, as well as decades earlier, which had always, I mean, American culture going back to the early 20th century and before had always portrayed the rich guy as the bad guy, you know, in shows like It's a Wonderful Life or You Can't Take It With You, which were, very, which were you know, movies made in the uh, 1930s, It's a Wonderful Life, 1940s, I assume It's a Wonderful Life, it's 1940s after the Second World War, and then uh, Jimmy Stewart also starred in You Can't Take It With You before the Second World War. But in both movies, the rich old guy is the bad guy who is in need of being reformed. And in uh, You Can't Take It With You, he is reformed. In It's a Wonderful Life, he's not reformed. But in any case, the low-income people, the average guy, the, that's where virtue lies. And the rich guy is out of touch is kind of pathetic in a way because he has he's profoundly mistaken. He thinks that uh, a man's life consists in the abundance of his possessions, and he's wrong. And the movie's very clear in making that point. So it's really a characteristic of American popular culture throughout the 20th century and earlier that the, the goal of life is not to accumulate wealth 
but to be a good person. But then suddenly, between 1997 and 2007, we utterly lost that. And, we cre- and, and the culture became, in the words of the UCLA researchers, a cult of fame and wealth. Mm. And the relentless message now that you get from performers like Justin Bieber, Cardi B, Bruno Mars, is that being rich and famous is what it's all about. And if you're not rich and famous, you're a loser. Yep. There's a big problem with that. Just that most of us will never be rich and famous, which means most of us are losers. Uh, by the standards of the culture that kids are buying into now, they will be losers. And that creates this uh, epidemic of anxiety, depression, and disengagement that we're seeing right now among American teenagers. I think, yeah, I think it's worse more than ever. And especially, I think as I've heard you talk about this before too, I think it's interesting to reflect back on even athletes. And now some of these athletes are making $200, $300 million a year. And for me, when I grew up, I wanted to become a professional football player. There there aren't many athletes making $200 million a year. They might have a $200 million contract. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Correct. Correct. That's right. That's right. But that's no matter what, it's a lot of money a lot of and money. a lot of fame yes. and a lot of endorsements. And uh, yes, correct. Their yeah. overall contract and covered. This evening, years. I'll, I'll speak to parents specifically about that about what are the odds of your son, who plays high school football, that's right. ever being in the National Football League? Well, there's over a million high school boys playing football in the United States right now. And there's 1,656 men on the 32 rosters of the National Football League which means the odds are about 600 to one against your son ever making it to the NFL. And the average NFL career is between two and three years. Uh, So that's maybe not the best career goal, but then I will contrast that with the boy who says, hey, I'm going to be the next ninja. So ninja is the uh, name uh, Tyler Blevins has given himself. Tyler Blevins uh, plays video games online and his Twitch account is very popular. And he earns north of $500,000 a month playing video games uh, because people pay to watch him play. He's he's a lot of fun to watch. He's very funny. And uh, teenage boys will say, hey, I'm going to be the next Tyler Blevins. I'm going to be the next ninja. Uh, Why do I need to learn about the War of 1812? I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be rich and famous. Well, let's run the numbers. Um, And I, I go through those numbers this evening about the total number of people who have professional accounts trying to earn money on Twitch. And how many people earned more than $100,000 last year on Twitch in that entire calendar year? 46 people made a six-figure income last year. So uh, it's about 20,000 to one. You've got about 20,000 people on Twitch for every one person making more than 100,000 a year. Actually, the odds of being successful in the National Football League, the odds of your high school football playing son are much better getting into the NFL than of ever making a six-figure income playing video games. And incidentally, those young people playing video games, that career lasts about 18 months. Wow. If they're at the top of their games, they burn out very quickly. Uh, so again, one of the things I'll be talking about with parents this evening is you have to be an agent of reality. Yep. You have to help your son or your daughter recognize, uh, look, uh, <laughs> you got to have a plan B because the odds of you're actually being a YouTube celebrity or a Tyler Blevins are on the order of one in 200,000, and you don't want to bank your life. Which I feel like is it's such an interesting topic for me, because I see it a lot in the mental health space, where people are out there saying how bad social media is. And I, I definitely want to get into that topic. But what I always, it always gets followed up um, most of the time with anyone that's out there talking about it is, you know, stay off the social media. It's increase in anxiety and depression and you're comparing yourself and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of it is always, but follow me on social media. I have my chat group that will help you how to prevent not being on social media. You won't media. hear that from me. That's right. And that's why I absolutely love your stuff. I just find it so interesting. And I, in earlier today, you had made a reference of um, unintended messages when it comes to grades and school and saying, you know, it's not about the grades, but then when a kid gets a B or a C, you're mad at them and it's that unintended message. Well, I see the same thing so often in social media. Um, It is that like, okay, that's kind of my question for you is when you have, when you get up there tonight and you talk to a lot of parents, do you feel like you're, and you're saying, you know, this is your kid shouldn't, your daughter should not be on social media. 
Actually, I will not say that. Okay. Um, again, my uh, recommendations are always grounded in the evidence. And I, in social media, I'm always citing the work of Jean Twenge, uh, uh, who is certainly our nation's leading scholar. And she and her colleagues looked at data from over 200,000 adolescents. And on the x-axis, you've got the amount of time kids spend on social media. And on the y-axis, you've got the risk of becoming anxious or depressed. Oh. And from zero to 30 minutes a day, uh, there's no increase. Hmm. Uh, the increase begins after 30 minutes a day. So again, based on the evidence, I'm going to advise parents no more than 30 minutes a day on social media. Now, I know of many parents who have prohibited social media for their kids. I don't have a problem with that. My daughter is not on social media. She's 15. Um, and, you know, I don't have any problem with saying, hey, no social media. But that recommendation cannot, the, the recommendation to prohibit social media cannot be grounded in evidence because there is not compelling evidence that kids who have no social media do better on average than kids who spend 20 or 30 minutes a day on social media. What we do know is that kids who are spending hour, an hour a day on social media do less well, are more likely to become anxious or depressed compared to kids who spend 30 minutes a day on social media. Kids who spend two hours a day on social media are at greater risk than kids who spend one hour a day, kids who spend three hours a day. It's a pretty linear increase after yeah. that 30 minutes a day. The big news this week, though, is two days ago, the Wall Street Journal published what really has to be considered one of the great scoops. Uh, they somehow, and they haven't said how, they somehow got their hands on a trove of internal Facebook documents never intended for public release. Facebook, it turns out, has teams of researchers who've been studying the effects of Instagram. Uh, Instagram is owned by Facebook. Um, and the Facebook researchers have determined that teenage girls are more likely to become anxious and depressed the more time they spend on Instagram. And this is true for every girl, whether she's black or white, affluent or low income, urban, suburban, or rural. Um, and it's a huge effect. And the, and the Facebook uh, employees have themselves been debating, uh, what should we do about this? All the time that Mark Zuckerberg has been the owner, the, you know, the, 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 the CEO basically has been claiming that, oh, it doesn't really have any effect. Uh, the right. evidence is all over the place. He's been lying. Uh, you know, in 2006, a federal judge ruled that the cigarette companies had been deceiving the public, had been willfully and knowingly deceiving the public that the cigarette companies knew beginning in the 1970s that cigarettes were harmful. And yet they deliberately claimed not to know that. They misled the public about what they knew. And then um, they had to pay for it. Um, and already in the last 48 hours since this Wall Street Journal story broke, uh, some are wondering, is Facebook in the same mind? They have been telling us for years that they have no evidence right. that Instagram is harmful to girls, and they were lying. They did have evidence. They had more evidence than, than had been publicly available. They knew that Instagram was harmful, but they didn't want to tell anybody because they didn't want to cut into their profits. Wow. And I know we talk a lot about girls on social media, but what's the impact? What's the research say about boys on social media? Okay. Boys are much less vulnerable to the toxic effects of social media. Boys are much more vulnerable to the addictive properties of video games. So this evening, we're going to, going to go into some detail as to why that is so um, and what the guidelines are. But uh, boys are clearly much less vulnerable to the toxic effects of social media. Wow. And then so, taking a step back, going the other way then, in regards to video games and the habits associated with that, what's the danger with that? Because my question with that, and when I read your book, I have to admit, candidly, I was partially defensive in that stance. Um, my wife came from a family of four girls, and they don't, none of them had video games, any of that kind of stuff. I grew up where a Friday nights were at my best friend's house, 15 of us playing video games, having a good time. And that was kind of my memory. And I understand the isolation piece. Um, but selfishly, I was like, oh, I have to defend it. I don't even know. I have a little girl now, and I'm like, I don't know when I'll have a boy or if. Um, but what is the, in your eyes and the research say about the dangers of video games? Okay. Well, there's two questions here. First of all, how much time spend, spend playing video games is too much time. Yep. And how do we know? And which video games are okay to play and which are not? And okay. How do we know? 
So those are two different questions. So uh, again, all my recommendations are always based in evidence, and we have a lot of good research. So uh, what the research shows, oh, so, so let's pose the question this way. What's your relationship between the amount of time you spend playing video games and how well you do in school? Well, researchers find that up to a threshold of about six hours a week, there is no relationship. So wow. a kid who spends five hours a week playing video games does no better and no worse on average than a kid who doesn't play video games at all. Beyond that threshold of six hours a week, there is a linear and negative association, which is a fancy way of saying the kid who spends 10 hours a week playing video games does less well in school than the kid who spends five hours a week playing video games. The kid who spends 20 hours a week playing video games does much less well. And I spoke to Craig Anderson, the lead investigator on that study, and I asked him, why is that? And he answered with one word. He said, displacement. What he means by displacement is that if you're spending 20 hours a week playing video games, that's 20 hours a week you're not doing something else like mm. studying or sleeping. A lot of boys are coming to school sleep deprived yeah. and teachers are telling me about boys who are literally falling asleep in class because they stayed up till two in the morning playing Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty. Uh, so that's one issue is you've got to limit the amount of time kids spend playing video games. Again, I'm not advising a prohibition. The evidence does not support that, but no more than 40 minutes a night on school nights, no more than an hour a day on weekends, and your minutes do not roll over. So if you go three <laughs> weeks without playing video games, that does not mean you're allowed to spend seven hours in a binge on a Saturday playing video games. That's binge gaming, and it's harmful. So how much time spent playing video games is one issue I address. Got good, issue, uh, good research on that. But a second question is, which video games are okay to play and which are not? And this is where uh, we've got some very important research, longitudinal cohort studies where you follow kids over a year's time and you find that kids playing violent video games, it changes their personality, not in a day or a week or a month, but over three years time. Kids playing violent video games where you have to kill in order to win, games like Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, they become less patient, less honest, and more selfish. Wow. Again, not in a day, not in a week, but over a year's time. And some games are worse than others. And by worse, I mean they push this change from honest to dishonest, from patient to impatient, from altruistic to selfish. Some games push that farther and faster than other games. The worst games are games which employ what the researchers call a moral inversion. A moral inversion means that in the context of the game, good is bad and bad is good. So for example, in GTA V, Grand Theft Auto, mm -hmm. in order to achieve your mission, you have to acquire money and weapons, and you can get the best weapons by killing police officers. So in the context of the game, it'd be a really clever thing to sneak up on some police officers and kill them. That way you get their weapons. That's the only way you can get their weapons. You have to kill them. Now in the real world, to sneak up on police officers and kill them just because they're police officers would be evil. Yep. But in the context of this game, it is a good and clever thing to do. That's a game kids should not be playing at all. Teenagers should not be playing Call of Duty. You uh, should not be playing Grand Theft Auto. Period. Yep. And parents have to enforce that. Um, and that means not only that your son is not allowed to play that game at home, but if he's going to a friend's house, you need to call up the friend's parents and say, "Hey, my son's going to be hanging with your son tomorrow afternoon. Will there be a grown-up around? Make sure they're not playing games like Grand Theft Auto." And if the other parent says, "Hey, they're going to go in the bedroom, close the door, play their games with headphones on." I'm not going to be chaperoning what games the teenage boys are playing. And it, it's your job to say to your son, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to go to that boy's house. And again, there's a website I'll recommend called Common Sense Media, where you can type in the name of any game and get a good, accurate review of that game so you know whether it's okay for your son to play or not. What would be a game that's on the approved list? Most of the sports games, Madden, okay. NFL football, NBA basketball, FIFA soccer, those are all fine. Wow. It's so fascinating. And then when you're even now, when you're referencing, you have your kid going over to a friend's house and you taught, you spend so much time talking about society today and the Grammys and case in point, you know, um, popular music, <laughs> yeah, popular music these days. Um, can you dive into a little bit of that, of the dangers of what and I think you, you spelled this out really well of kids now are losing the ability to understand right versus wrong because it's applauded in society, yet it is a, a, a bad thing in a one-on-one -on -one context most of the time. But then in their headphones, they're listening to mm -hmm. some absolutely horrific stuff. 
Yeah. So Bruno Mars got six Grammys for his song, That's What I Like. Uh, so in that song, he's addressing a young woman he appears not to know, and he offers her a champagne, then a trip to Paris, and finally offers just to give her his uh, credit card if she will just turn around and drop it for a player, because that's what I like. He's offering money for sex. Um, and this was the most popular song in the country, number one hit song, six Grammys. You know, how is a young man supposed to know that offering a woman money for sex is wrong? Uh, you know, suppose a, so this, the song begins, Hey baby girl, what's happening? I got a condo in Manhattan. You and your blank invited. Uh, you know, suppose a young man in the workplace goes up to a female colleague and says, Hey baby girl, what's happening? You and your blank invited and then offers her money for sex. Uh, well, he'd get fired yeah. or he would be at, at the very least disciplined and he'd have to attend a workshop on sexual harassment where he would, he would learn it's never acceptable to offer a colleague money for sex. But he might re reasonably answer. He might say, hey, that's exactly what Bruno Mars did in his song. Uh, and he got six Grammys. Number one hit song in the United States. 1.4 billion, billion with a B, uh, views on his YouTube video for that song. How is a young man to know if he has received no instruction? Uh, kids are not born knowing right from wrong. They have to be taught. And if we don't teach them, they look to the popular culture. And the American popular culture, a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it now is now really toxic. And parents need to be aware of that. And one of the very concrete recommendations I'll have for parents this evening is no earbuds, no headsets in the car. When you're in the car, you should be listening to your kid and your kid should be listening to you, not to Bruno Mars or Cardi B. Wow. <laughs> I think, and you've mentioned this, you spend a lot of time studying German with your daughter. Yes. So. <laughs> To me, I think that's the coolest thing. I am so eager to learn Italian with Gianna, um, but it is so counterculture, right? Like it to me, it feels like there's so much of the rest of society wants to just go ahead, listen to your. Here's the iPad. Watch something. Watch man, Disney. Man muss jedem Tag jede Gelegenheit Deutsch zu sprechen. Ah. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, my daughter and I really get a kick out of it. I'm very uh, blessed and fortunate that. She has somehow inherited my uh, interest in German language and German culture, and she gets a huge kick out of us talking German together when no one else can understand it, which is possibly not a good thing. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and we're very fortunate that our uh, school has made a special arrangement for her to study German because it's not wow. generally offered at the school. Wow, that's amazing. Um, what would when you look at it, and I know you say. Um, it's the collapse of parenting this authoritative figure um, in the relationship of kids and their parents. Um, when you look at the overall messaging out there, and I think you provided some amazing uh, evidence today when you were speaking, even as simple as you, as a parent, I would want to trust and naturally trust Disney, Nickelodeon, Nick Jr., any of that kind of stuff to be, oh, this is a solid source to teach my kid. But now it seems, and I think that's what scares me the most, is it is so hard to know and, and trust yourself in what to do and how to actually raise your kid and what are the main things that you should focus on with yourself and your child. Well, certainly fewer screens. And uh, if your kid's going to be looking at a, a TV, there's uh, one TV in the house in a common family room. That's what I'll recommend. That's what we have in my own home. I don't have a TV in my bedroom. My daughter doesn't have a TV in her bedroom. We have one TV in the family room. And if we watch TV, which we don't do very often, we watch TV together. Again, it costs nothing to do that. Yep. It just requires parents to have a clear sense of uh, what the family is for. And sometimes parents will say, oh, well, I got to watch the evening news. And I'll say, seriously? No, really? No, you don't. No, you don't. Why do you want you don't want to look at the evening news. You can, you can read it in the newspaper. You don't need to watch it on TV. Totally. Um, in your opinion, then, what should parents, the ultimate focus of being a parent be? And I know you answered this in the book. Yes. Yeah. So again, as I said earlier, my recommendations are always grounded in evidence. What should a parent's first priority be? Well, as it happens, we have good research that allows us to answer that question in an evidence-based fashion. And I'm referring now to a series of longitudinal cohort studies done in the United States and indeed around 
the developed world. And in each of these studies, researchers follow kids from uh, early childhood through adolescence into adulthood to determine what characteristic of a child that I can influence best predicts health, wealth, and happiness uh, when the kid is 32, 35, 38 years of age. And it turns out that what best predicts health, wealth, and happiness is conscientiousness, which means honesty and self-control. Uh, grades in school do not predict it. Uh, having lots of friends does not predict it. Emotional stability does not predict it. Uh, so it follows from this research that teaching your child virtue and character, conscientiousness, should be your first priority as a parent. It feels like such a challenge in this day and age where it is everything, um, here at Lord's being a classical school, I've learned a lot. My background being in public schools and my entire journey thus far was always about the end result. And unfortunately, that end result always, when I wrapped myself in that identity, put me into a total tailspin. And I, and I think what's so interesting now when you say this dilemma with social media starting in 2000 and where we're at. Everybody at the top that everyone aspires to be, and I know a lot of the LA crew, everyone's more depressed than ever. On social media, on, you know, on the big screen, they look very happy. But once they get to that isolated position, they are more depressed. And that's where you see so much suicide, drug abuse. All of that kind of... Uh, well, I don't know about necessarily more depressed, but I would certainly agree that they're not necessarily happier. Okay. It is certainly the case that uh, beyond 50000 a year, money does not buy happiness. Um, and we have so much research on this point. We can say with confidence that people earning 500000 a year are not any happier than people earning 60000 a year. People, uh, investment bankers earning $5 million a year are not any happier than surgeons earning 500000 a year. In fact, there's research from Sunni Aluthar um, suggesting that uh, they may be less happy. They may be. Um, but it is certainly the case that money does not buy happiness. It is certainly the case that professional success does not guarantee happiness. And that's uh, what David Brooks calls the big lie in American culture right now, that uh, our schools and our popular culture uh, teaches kids that, hey, if you're really successful, you will be happy. And it's just not true. Uh, and, I, you know, as a physician, I've seen surgeons who are very successful as surgeons and have a very big practice and earn 800000 a year. And they're absolutely miserable as people uh, because they bought into this notion that professional success would give them happiness, and it doesn't. Uh, Happiness is not about professional success. Happiness, whether or not you're happy, begins with the quality of your personal relationships, of your intimate relationships. If you're in a strong marriage and uh, your kids uh, are, are doing well and you get along well with them, then you're going to be happy. Uh, if you're earning 800000 a year and your spouse hates you and your kids hate you, you're going to be miserable. Uh, professional success and money will not protect you, will not buy happiness. And, you know, we all know that intellectually, but I don't know that we know it in our gut. Uh, I think many Americans assume at some level that if they were just more successful, mm -hmm. just had a little bit more money, then they would be happier. And it's just not true. I think what's interesting hearing that is. And as I've started to dive more in my faith and, and being a Christian, I've heard that said. And it's sometimes easy for my mind to go, well, then I don't want to achieve any sort of financial success. Like it almost kind of scares me to think that if, from what I've seen just based on my experience, there's almost a negative um, effect of financial success. Well, again, the evidence does not, uh, there's one researcher out there named Sunil Luthar uh, who has made that argument, um, but it, it's on, it, and, and her research really has focused on children and teenagers uh, where there is uh, uh, 
some evidence that affluent kids may be at greater risk for anxiety and depression compared with low-income kids. That is a new finding, incidentally, which clearly was not the case 30 years ago. So the question that then arises is, well, what's changed about the culture? 30 years ago, being affluent was not a risk factor for depression among American kids. Today, it is. Uh, but whether that's true for adults is a much iffier proposition. But what, as I said earlier, what we can say with confidence is that people earning five million a year are not happier than people earning eighty thousand a year. We can say that with confidence. We can also say with confidence that people earning eighty thousand a year are happier than people who have no income or people who are homeless. Uh, so it is not the case that homeless people are as happy as people earning a modest income. Uh, if you don't know where you're going to sleep and you don't know where your next meal is coming from and you're really hungry, then you're not going to be happy. You have to satisfy those basic needs of food and shelter, uh, which in most communities in the United States, you can do pretty readily with an income of 40000 a year. 40000 a year can get you a place to live and food on the table. Um, so from going from zero to 40,000 a year, you do see an increase in happiness beyond 60,000 a year. There's no income, no, no increase in happiness. As I've said several times now, people earning 200,000 a year are not happier than people earning 70,000. So again, that's not a reason why you shouldn't strive to be successful. If you enjoy your work and you want to make a contribution in your work, and that means you're going to earn more money. I don't see anything wrong with that. But don't think that's going to make you happier because it probably will not. It naturally this leads me to your conversation. I know you cite this all over the place, but um, with Dr. Wright in Australia, and and if you, uh, I'll actually, I'd prefer if you kind of dive into that story because I think it leads to, you know, maybe some of that success and financial success is a byproduct of what you guys discuss, and that's. Okay. Fine. So Dr. Wright hired me to uh, uh, sp uh, spend two days at his school, which is Shore. It's a boys' private school uh, in an affluent suburb of Sydney, Australia. And uh, uh, he and I had worked out the format in advance, of course, uh, which was that I'm going to spend a good chunk of those two days meeting with the boys at the school. And whenever I meet with students, it's always a back and forth. It's never a, a formal didactic presentation. It's a back and forth. I ask questions. I call on students who have their hands raised for answers, and we have this kind of Socratic back and forth. So Dr. Wright said to me, uh, all right, ask me the questions you're going to ask the boys. Um, so, you know, I've, I've done this with many kids uh, across the United States and around the world. Uh, and typically when I meet with high school kids, I might ask questions like, uh, what's high school for? And the kids will say, it's to get into good college. Then I'll say, well, what's, what do you have to get into good college for? And they'll say, well, to get a good job. And then I'll say, well, why do you need a good job? And they'll say, to make lots of money. And I'll say, why do you need lots of money? And they'll say, to have fun. So uh, Dr. Wright said, what, what questions are you going to ask the boys tomorrow? I said, well, one of the questions I'll ask them is, what is school for? And Dr. Wright said, school is preparation for life. It is not about getting into the top university. It is preparation for life. So then I answered him as, as I would answer any student who said the same thing. I said, what is life for? And he answered immediately, even before I'd finished the question, before the words were out, he said, human life is for three things. Meaningful work, a person to love, and a cause to embrace. And I said, okay. <laughs> I'm not saying Dr. Wright is the guru. I'm not saying you have to accept his answers. But you have to have an answer. When your kid asks you, why should I work hard at school? You better have an answer uh, that is more meaningful than, well, because you have to get into CU Boulder or you have to get into Stanford. That answer will not satisfy. Uh, it, you have to give an answer better than, well, you have to get a good job and earn lots of money. That answer will not satisfy. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And if that's the best you can give, well, you got to go to CU Boulder and get a good job and earn lots of money. That will not satisfy. And the result will be that working hard at school just becomes a race to nowhere, to borrow the title of a documentary making that point. And the result will be anxiety, depression, and disengagement. 
you've got to communicate to your kid your understanding of the big picture. Why are we here? What is human life for? And it could be to glorify the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, if that's what you believe. Uh, but you've got to believe it. It's got to be genuine. If it's not genuine, it's worthless, and your kid will see right through you. So looking back on myself, I think when I hear Dr. Wright's answers, number one, meaningful work. Um, I love what I do here at Lord's and I'm just stepping into it. I was in commercial real estate for a long time before this, but I think, and I, and as I look back and I hear what you're saying, I spent way too much time on video games. I spent way too much time, um, trying to be the best football player of all time. And I didn't ever spend the time to really understand what spoke to me. And I, I struggle with how do you explain to someone, um, this concept of what is meaningful work? to find that satisfaction. And sure, maybe again, a byproduct is financial success or any of that kind of stuff. But if my little girl asked me that, I think I still, I've lived so much of the other that I, it's hard for me to define, even in myself. Well, I think it's a very good question. So what is meaningful work? What do you really want to do? Not what do you think would earn a lot of money, but what is your heart's desire? It's not a trivial question. The great American psychologist, Dr. Abraham Maslow, believed that many adults are miserable because they're working hard at a job they don't like in pursuit of goals that are not meaningful to them. So it is one of the jobs of the child and teenager to figure out for themselves, what do I really want to do? What work would be meaningful for me? And you know, I know a teenage girl who just desperately wants to be a, a, a kindergarten teacher. Now, I personally would not want to be a kindergarten teacher. I would not enjoy that work. I would not find it meaningful, but it is meaningful work. Uh, and if that's where your passion, and I know that girl's parents are saying to her, you know, kindergarten teachers don't earn much money. You're not going to be uh, happy. And I've gently spoken to those parents and said, you know, if that's where her passion is and that's what she wants to do, you've made your point. You're quite right. Kindergarten teachers don't earn much money, but she won't starve. If that's what she wants to do and she understands she might end up living in a small apartment and not eating at nice restaurants, if that's her passion, that's okay. You know, there's that great passage in Paul's letter where he says that I cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. A healthy culture needs kindergarten teachers. And if that's her passion, then you have to allow her to do that. You know, I've spoken to so many parents who are like, hey, my kid can do anything they want to. I, I'm fine with that. Totally fine with that. But when, then when you talk with those parents more closely, you realize that when they say my kid can do anything they want to do, what they really mean is my kid can be a doctor, lawyer, or investment banker, but anything else is a failure. Uh, there's a lot of different jobs out there. There's a lot of way to make a contribution. And parents need to be open to that, that maybe your kid's path goes in a different direction than what you have planned for them. Um, it's very exciting to be a parent because you don't know what your kid's potential is. You don't know what their destiny is. You don't know what their greatest potential, uh, where their greatest potential lies, and neither do they. So you want to help them figure it out. Uh, but if you push them too hard in one direction, you may not be successful. Uh, so you, sometimes you need to step back, especially as your kid gets older and moves through adolescence. You need to be prepared to step back and let your kid chart their own path. If you don't mind me asking, um, I mean, you accompl you've accomplished so many amazing things, but graduating MIT at 19, how did you find at such a young age, um, and then you went on to get your MD and PhD, um, meaningful work at such a young age and like to what you're doing now? Okay. Well, if you want to talk about MIT, <laughs> we'll talk about MIT. The MIT story is all about my mom, who was a single mom and didn't have much money. And she was taking out loans in her name, uh, not my name, but she was borrowing money in her name to put me through MIT. And MIT at that time, I don't know if this is still true, 
you could take any number of courses per semester. The, the charge was not per credit, it was per semester. So I took eight <laughs> courses a semester uh, to graduate uh, in two years. Wow. Uh, to save my mom money. And she had always promised she would pay for college and I'd pay for anything after that. So I then took out loans to go through medical school and I borrowed a lot of money in my name to get through medical school. But I'm very grateful to her for paying for college. So the motivation to get through MIT, uh, which I hated incidentally, I, I did not like MIT. Um, um, uh, it was, it was the worst possible school for me. I was a shy, young, um, uh, very shy young man. And it was at that time 90% male, 10% female. And in high school, all my best friends were girls. So at MIT, I had no best friends. Uh, I, um, I was a loner. It was a, a, not a good experience. But I was anxious to get through because I, I wanted to save my mom money. Um, and I didn't want to consider transferring because that would have meant more college. I wanted to get out as quickly as possible. So, yeah, it is a true statement that I graduated from MIT <laughs> in two years at the age of 19, but it's not anything I'm proud of. I did it because uh, I didn't want to see my mom go into debt, putting me through college. And then being a doctor and a researcher and author now, that did you always know that's what you wanted to do? Absolutely not. <laughs> Uh, no, absolutely not. So I, I really wanted to study the brain and mind. I was fascinated by uh, the whole question of mind. So if the brain is an organ, um, it's about three pounds. Um, how is it possible that love, perception, emotion arises from this lump uh, I mean, uh, the liver is an organ of comparable size, but the liver doesn't feel, the liver doesn't perceive. Um, how is this possible? That question fascinated me. And that's why I went to the University of Pennsylvania to earn my doctorate in psychology. I wanted to study neuroscience. This was really before, uh, the, the neuroscience department was just started and it was very low status. Basically, you went into neuroscience if you couldn't get accepted into the department of psychology. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but that was my, what, what we now call neuroscience was what interested me, uh, that intersection between brain and mind. And, um, uh, my doctoral dissertation advisor, Randy Gallistel was horrified by my utter ignorance of physiology, anatomy, neuroanatomy, and biochemistry. And he said, Leonard, you know, it's great that you want to study brain and mind, but you are profoundly ignorant. You need to walk over to the medical school and take uh, uh, anatomy, neuroanatomy, biochemistry, pharmacology, if you want to be competent in this field. Uh, well, looking at the catalog, I learned that if I took all the courses my advisor insisted I take, I only had to do eight months of clinical rotations, and I'd be eligible for the MD degree. And uh, merely as a matter of grantsmanship, as a scholarly researcher, I already knew. Uh, that MD PhDs are more successful at getting grants than uh, PhDs were. And that was and remains the case. So I applied only to the University of Pennsylvania. I didn't apply to any other medical school. And I wrote in my application essay where you basically had to say why you want to go to medical school. I said, I have no interest in ever practicing medicine. I am seeking medical education only in order to be a better a researcher, because I now recognize you cannot understand the brain in isolation from the rest of the body. And I was accepted in the first wave uh, and stayed at Penn to earn my PhD at the same time I was earning my MD. And I later served on the admissions committee as a medical student. And you get so sick of these essays from kids saying, well, I've always loved people and I also love science. So I want to be a doctor so that I can serve people and also uh, study science. And it's like, oh, come on, gag me with a spoon. I'm so sick of that. <laughs> and I realized now that my essay must have been such a brush of, breath of fresh air. I have no interest in ever practicing medicine. <laughs> I solely want to be a researcher. And of course, Penn has always styled, or for many decades, uh, University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine has styled itself as um, a great research uh, university that it's not primarily about preparing doctors for primary care. It is first and foremost about cutting edge research. 
So without me ever attending it, it was exactly the right essay to submit. So I began my medical studies, which, uh, you know, the first year of the basic sciences is really uh, pretty straightforward. You just have to learn all this stuff. And then I began the required clinical rotations. And I discovered to my great astonishment that I enjoyed being with people. That this guy who had literally been pulled off a grate, a homeless guy, who had all kinds of medical and psychiatric problems. You know, as a medical student, your job is to do the history and physical, to spend a few hours learning everything there is to know about this guy. And I found it absolutely fascinating. The history of an individual human being was of just mind-blowing interest to me. And I had also then had enough knowledge at the graduate level to learn that the question that had attracted me into research, which is try to understand how you get mind out of brain, would not be solved in my lifetime and may indeed not be solvable. Right. And may not be within the reach of human understanding. And incidentally, that was exactly the right call. We are no closer to understanding that now than we were 40 years ago. Um, and so I changed my goal and I decided I'm not going to be a researcher. I'm going to be a clinician. I'm going to be a family doctor, which really upset all of my advisors <laughs> at Penn because the University of Pennsylvania is not about preparing doctors for family medical practice. It's not about primary care. It's about the specialties. Right. Um, you know, in my graduated class, I think we had 30 kids going into orthopedic surgeon, surgery. I was one of five kids going into family medicine. Wow. Um, but I had decided that's what I want to do. I want to work with people. So, and that was a decision I made really at, at the age of 25. So I had no clue what I was going to do. Um, and, um, and then I became a family doctor. And after 19 years of, of doing family medicine, I took a, an extended sabbatical uh, because I had become very interested in education and, be, and began visiting schools. I've now visited over 460 schools uh, around the United States and around the world. And um, so uh, uh, I, I, I quote a, a line from uh, Friedrich Nietzsche that begins, Es gibt ein Grad von Ungeduld bei Menschen der Tat und des Gedankens. There, there's a kind of impatience among people um, where they jump from one thing to another. And yeah. that's certainly characteristic of me that I have bounced around, that I have not pursued one goal, that I have gone in different directions. Um, so, and I, I tell my daughter, you don't have to decide now what you're going to do forever. That may change. Uh, I tell her the most important choice you make in life is who you marry. Mm. Anything else you can change. You can change what you do. Uh, but if you marry the wrong person, and especially if you have children with the wrong person, yeah. it's going to it's going to create some major obstacles. And she's seen this firsthand. Both my brothers uh, went through difficult divorces from their first wives that continue to make their lives difficult many, many years down the road. Uh, divorce is usually uh, a messy catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you can call my daughter right now and say, what's the most important thing you... The most important choice you make in life, and she will tell you it's who you. Wow! I thought you were going to say humility. You really, <laughs> you really got me right there. Um, a question I'm dying to ask you is, especially when you started your sabbatical and you really started to dive into um, being an author, doing all the research you've done. Where we're at now, does has your work been motivating or? Um, frustrating as i've seen you've had to update a lot of your books and not because it's almost like what if your your work is a timepiece and it's only being proven more and as you're going out and you've been to over 400 schools you're doing all this work like boots on the ground it almost seems like it's just becoming more and more validating but in a way i would find that frustrating because you're just beating your head against the wall and seeing schools and education systems and especially the u.s from what I've gathered in a lot of what you've said, 
Like when I hear you speak, I went home last night. I told my wife, I was like, I want to move to Sweden. Like we don't have success. We we have very little chance of success in the U.S. Um, I do not hold up Sweden. As I, yeah, I forget which one. Switzerland. Switzerland. German, German okay, that's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it was. Um, and I think that was based on you were talking about how the U.S. has dramatically fallen behind on many scales. But it's a it's an interesting thing that I was reflecting on for you is is do you find you get more motivated as time has gone on, or is it becoming more frustrating as you see a lot of these? I would say systems? neither. I would okay. say that I've learned that. Um, so one reason I took that sabbatical, I had been visiting schools and and creating this compendium of gender aware best practices for the content areas, and we had by 2008 we had really good evidence that my gosh, this is really immensely effective. Uh, at boosting achievement and motivation for, bo- for both girls and boys, getting more girls excited about computer science and physics and engineering, getting more boys, boys who love football and Grand Theft Auto, getting boys excited about creative writing and poetry and Emily Dickinson. And I thought, boy, if I can just get in front of a school board and share this, we could really change things for the better. It doesn't cost anything. That's right. It doesn't require changing class size. It just requires teachers to be aware of these gender aware instructional strategies. So for five years, I went around the United States uh, making this point, and uh, I think it's fair to say I accomplished very little. I learned that school boards are not driven, public school boards are not driven primarily by evidence, but by politics. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I had to kind of ratchet back my goals. I'm not gonna change the country. I'm not going to change the politics. I want nothing to do with the politics. But if a school engages me, say, hey, we'd like you to work with our school to boost achievement and motivation for every student here, then I am all in, absolutely. Because I'm very confident that I can make a difference sharing what I've learned from all these visits and these 20 years now visiting schools. Um, there's more than 90,000 public schools in the United States. And I, I love to come back to that old story everybody knows of the man walking across the beach at low tide and he's picking up the starfish and throwing it back in. And there's a whole bunch of these starfish that are slowly dying at low tide. And the other person says to them, look, there's, there's got to be a thousand starfish here that are dying. You know, what difference can you possibly make? Uh, you're not going to walk 10 miles of beach what difference does it make? And he picks up a starfish and he says, it makes a difference to this one. Uh, so, wow. you know, I'm not going to change American yeah. education. I'm not going to have, you know, a huge impact on the 90,000 public schools in the United States. But I can tell you about individual schools where I have had an impact and teachers and students who say I've made a difference. And that's very rewarding. And that's what it's about. Wow. Have you read um, from... A sp- documentary ish uh, or heard of the book what made maddie run oh my gosh uh i have a presentation on what made maddie run um absolutely i don't know that all your people listening will know the story (laughs) but i can uh it is absolutely central to uh, uh, the talks that i do for parents so madison halloran was a uh, extraordinary young woman who was um, a very fine student at her high school in northern New Jersey, uh, where I have visited and I've spoken to parents in that community, incidentally, um, and also an outstanding athlete. Yep. Uh, led her teach, led her her girls soccer team to the state championship in two consecutive years as the captain, and then started running in the off-season and became a champion runner and won the state championship in her event. Um, And her dream was to be an Ivy League student athlete. That was her dream. Um, And her dream came true. She was accepted to the University of Pennsylvania, where she indeed became an Ivy League student athlete. And her dream became a nightmare. And within a few weeks of enrolling at Penn, she realized, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I don't like it at all. She, in retrospect, she was unwise to accept the offer to be in track. Her first love was soccer. Lehigh, a less prestigious college, had offered her a scholarship to play soccer at Lehigh. That's what she should have done. She loves soccer. 
Soccer is all about community and teamwork. And she had done track in the off season with her friends, but she didn't have friends at Penn. She didn't know anyone at Penn. And track at Penn meant running endless laps alone. And she hated it. She hated it. And she wanted to quit. But she had bought into this American notion that winners never quit yep. and quitters never win. And she could not quit. And she regarded transferring as quitting, that winners never quit and, winner, and quitters never win. And so she was trapped by her own beliefs. Uh, and she met with the coach January 2014 and said, I need to step back. I need to quit the team for a time. And the coach said, don't quit. We'll accommodate you. You don't have to come to every practice. You don't have to go to the meets, but don't be a quitter. Don't be a quitter. And a few days later, she took her own life by jumping off a tower in Rittenhouse Square. And I think we have so much to learn from that. Part of the story that has to be told, and that's why when I do this presentation, I show pictures mm -hmm. of Madison Halloran because she was beautiful. Yep. She had it all. She had it all. She was the prettiest. She was the smartest. She had the most friends. She was, had, was the most popular. And when other kids heard about this, Madison Halloran, Madison Halloran, you got to be kidding. Not, she had everything. Yep. She was the golden girl. She had it all. How is this possible? And so that's, that's a big part of my presentation on uh, resilience, that part of being resilient means being adaptive. Adaptive means that you are prepared to walk away, that you're prepared to say, I made the wrong choice. Uh, and I, I think we do a terrible job as a culture in teaching kids um, the need to be adaptive, that, that, that success means moving from one failure to the next with no loss of enthusiasm, that it's okay to, to acknowledge that you have failed and move on. Uh, we need to teach that to our kids, and our culture is doing a really bad job. It's such an interesting perspective that that book, um, written by Kate Fagan, who is from my alma mater. Um, I've been absolutely obsessed with that book and I had my own mental health struggles and blah, blah, blah. blah. So it really struck a chord for me, just being an athlete at that level and understanding those pressures. But I also found it so interesting. And again, why collapse of parenting and social and the, the pressures around social media and really trying to prevent my daughter, Gianna, in that sense. Maddie was posting minutes before yes. her suicide. Um, and if you and her social media is still up, and you can go find her Instagram page. And it is absolutely heart wrenching because to your point, she was an absolute, absolutely gorgeous girl, had it on paper all going for her. And nobody knew the struggles. I think it was remarkable the parents gave everything to Kate and said, here's the cell phones, here's the computers, yes. here's the. And it's well, so the parents valuable. had a clue and yeah. they urged her to get counseling and she said that she would, but she did not confide in her parents the depth of the uh, dilemma that she had found herself in that she could not quit. You know, from a grown up's perspective, it would have been so easy for her to just say, Hey, you know, I'm out of here. That's I'm, right. I'm, I'm going to take a semester off and then I'm going to start over at Lehigh. That would have fixed it. But she couldn't do it. She yep. just couldn't do it. She could not accept that notion that she had failed. She'd never failed. In retrospect, her high school set her up yep. because she never failed. She always won. Her team was undefeated the two yep. years that she was captain. They won every game. She was the best at everything. And so she was unprepared. This evening, I'm going to share... Another line from that uh, school I, I visited in Australia, sure, where the head of school says to the parents of new students, he, he says, I do hope that your son will be profoundly disappointed during his time at our school. <laughs> and the parents will always say, why would you hope for such a thing? And the head of school will say, because if he is not profoundly disappointed during his time at our school, he will not be prepared for okay. disappointment when it comes and it will surely come. In retrospect, 
the the problem with Madison Halloran's high school, she never failed. Yep. She was always number one, always winning the awards, always successful. So she was not prepared for disappointment, for failure uh, when it came and it came. Is it safe to say that you're not a fan of participation awards? I am sure that's actually a different, a different topic though. Uh, so uh, that's a topic out of my book, Boys Adrift. Uh, and so uh, Boys Adrift, the focus of that book is why this growing gender gap in achievement with more and more boys uh, disengaging uh, and not doing as well as their sisters. And this is a growing phenomenon in the United States. Uh, and it is true among affluent families, just as it is true among low-income families. Um, and there's many factors. So uh, uh, the subtitle is the five factors driving the growing epidemic of unmotivated boys and underachieving young men. And one of those five factors is changes in education. And one of the four changes in education that's occurred over the last 30 years that's contributed to this is the abolition of competitive formats. And that means everybody gets a trophy. And the problem with everybody gets a trophy is that if everybody gets a trophy, then for many boys, the trophy ain't worth anything. And I share a story of a second grade boy who uh, a PE instructor announced that, uh, hey, a week from Tuesday, we're going to have a race. And every kid, every second grader is going to be expected. We're going to line up and, and we're all going to uh, you know, want you to run four times around the track. And this boy took that very seriously and began preparing. And during recess and at lunch, he would go out and run around the oval. Uh, and then the big day comes and the PE instructor, all the 35 second graders are lined up. And he says, on your mark, get set, go. And this boy ran as hard and fast as he could. And he came in second, second out of 35. And he was very proud of that until the teacher gave a first place ribbon to every student, including the kid who had walked one lap and then quit. And the boy came home in tears, tears of anger. And he said, the teacher tricked us. The teacher said it was going to be a real race, and it wasn't. He said, I'm never going to run a race again. Uh, everybody gets a trophy. Doesn't understand what motivates many boys. Uh, you have to have competitive formats. And if you abolish competitive formats, you will lose some boys. And I think when you, when you first started to bring that up, for me, I also... I would think that it teaches, it doesn't enable kids to learn how to lose on, as another repercussion, going back um, to the head, the headmaster of the school in Australia, what's his name? It's uh, Dr. Wright. Is Dr. Wright. That ability to um, prepare you for life. And, and what I get concerned about when I think about these participation awards, it's just once life actually serves you a loss, you don't know what to do with it. You've never, you've never had to experience it, um, whether it's, you know, Maddie and this and all her success, but also on the flip side of, you don't have that competitive nature, but now you're, you're a fish out of water when you actually are faced in adversity. Well, that's absolutely going to be our focus this evening. And of course, it's a major focus in my book, The Collapse of Parent. That's right. Well, Dr. Sachs, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I could not um, encourage our listeners more to li to read any of Dr. Sachs's books. I'm absolutely obsessed and have a lot of reading to do in the other ones, but the collapse of parenting. Um, and I feel like I need to learn more than ever after reading it, but I am so excited to be able to spend this time with you and can't thank you enough. Thanks again.